Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, thanks for attending this afternoon's uh, second Express Sessions, a uh, conversation about the local rental market and Airbnb and other short-term rental applications. I'm Brian Boyhan, the former editor and publisher of the Sag Harbor Express. And on behalf of co-publishers Gavin Manu and Catherine Manu, event coordinator Ellen Diogardi and e news editor Stephen Coates, who's over there, I welcome you to today's lunch, graciously hosted today by the American Hotel. We'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors for making these sessions possible, including our presenting sponsors, GN Ferraris, Certified Public Accountants, and, <laughs> and the Adam Miller Group. Also, our lead sponsors, the Sag Harbor Variety Store, Attorney John Leonard, <laughs> and the Sag Harbor Chamber of Commerce. Also, uh, BNB Bank, the Washwick Agency, Dayton, and Osb Dayton Ritz and Osborne, Attorney Tiffany Scarlato, Fisher's Home Furnishings, Harbor Books, and Burke and Sullivan Attorneys at Law. Thank you all. Uh, we'd also like to thank LTV for uh, filming Express Sessions and for offering technical support. Uh, since this event sold out two weeks ago, the fact that they are recorded and available for view is very important, so we'd like to extend our thanks very much to the folks over at LTV. Uh, in a moment, we'll introduce our panel and open the floor to comments and questions. Please, we ask you that you keep your comments brief, uh, maybe a minute or less, and please speak into the microphone which we will bring you. This is a, an open conversation. We have some co questions prepared for our panelists, but this is a conversation that you, uh, community members and people in our audience, uh, are, are encouraged to participate in with, uh, in many cases, elected officials, uh, uh, representatives of business, and uh, I'm happy to say we actually have the author of the definitive book about Airbnb here today. Uh, so now on to today's conversation. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Gavin Manu. I'm the publisher of the Sag Harbor Express. Thank you all for coming down today. Um, Airbnb, as most of you know, is an uh, international online marketplace and hospitality service that owns no real estate. It is an online broker dealing primarily with short-term rentals that receives fees in conjunction with its bookings. According to its website, Airbnb has over 4 million listings for lodging in 65,000 cities and 191 countries worldwide. Since the company's founding in 2008, Airbnb has facilitated over 260 million guest arrivals. Uh, prior to today's session, we did reach out to Airbnb, uh, hoping to have a representative join us today. But uh, they, they could not get someone out to Sag Harbor, but they did send a statement from Josh Meltzer, who's the company's head of Northeast policy, which I will read right now. Um, at Airbnb, we are proud of the progress we have made in democratizing travel, providing a means for individuals and families to see places that they might have otherwise missed, including Sag Harbor. In, 2000, in 2017 alone, hundreds of your community members shared their homes with thousands of guests taking home $4 million in the Sag Harbor area in extra income, and all while helping to grow the local economy by encouraging guests to support the many restaurants, bars, and museums that are just around the corner. As we work to support strong local neighborhoods, keeping our community safe both online and off is our priority. There have been more than 260 million guest arrivals in Airbnb listings to date, and negative incidents are extremely rare. But even so, we're constantly working to improve our platform, our policies, and our protections, because even one incident is too many. We are pleased that so many members of the community are meeting here today in a thoughtful and open way, and look forward to continuing to ensure fair and reasonable regulations for home sharing. In terms of how Airbnb and other sites like HomeAway and VRBO have affected the local rental market, East Hampton Town in 2015 created a registry requiring landlords to register their property with the town and obtain a rental ID number prior to advertising or leasing their homes. 
Town officials wrote into the law that it was designed to address rising concerns of single-family homes being overcrowded and utilized as share houses. Also, that the law would help public safety personnel ensure compliance with the provisions of the town code, which allows for homeowners two short-term rentals of two weeks or less every six months. Otherwise, homeowners can rent their homes for two weeks or longer without restriction. While the town board was unanimous in, adopt in adopting the law, it was not without opposition from some members of the community. The level of opposition prompted then town supervisor Larry Cantwell to question whether the complainers were, quote, trying to protect a great deal of high turnover weekly rentals going on in our town. Since 2008, Southampton Town has required that property owners obtain a rental permit and submit a sketch of the house's layout showing the location of bedrooms. Before receiving a permit, they must agree to a safety inspection to make sure smoke and carbon monoxide detectors are in place. There are no electrical problems and that the house is not being used, for lack of a better term, as barrack style housing. Houses can be rented from no more than, to no more than four unrelated people and there can be no more than four vehicles parked at a home overnight. The code says transient rentals are prohibited, but the minimum rental period is 14 days. There is no maximum number of those 14-day rentals. In other words, you could rent it every two weeks, 26 times a year. Town officials said enforcement of the code is largely complaint-driven, but town code enforcement officers do make the rounds looking for signs of overcrowding and short-term rentals, and also monitor town building records to look for houses that could be candidates for illegal rentals. Recently, the town board amended its law to allow for short-term rentals during major public events, such as this year's U.S. Open Golf Tournament, which will take place in June at Shinnecock Hills. Sag Harbor Village does not currently have anything official on the books, but the Board of Trustees has had informal conversations about looking into the possibility of some kind of rental law. We offer a lot of this information as a way to kind of frame a conversation that we're going to have today. There's obviously, um, for many of us, we take um, uh, uh, advantage of Airbnb. Um, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting service. Uh, for others um, who may fear having a hotel operating in their backyard or next door neighbors, it's a concern. And our elected officials are wrestling with trying to find a balance. Um, with this, we turn to our panel, uh, which includes, I'd like to introduce them, Southampton Town Supervisor Jay Schneiderman. <laughs> South Hole Town Supervisor Scott Russell. Uh, East Hampton Town Councilman Jeffrey Bragman. <laughs> Sag Harbor Village Trustee Aidan Korish. Um, Fortune Magazine Assistant Managing Editor and author of the book, The Airbnb Story, How Three Ordinary Guys Disrupted an Industry, Made Billions, and Created Plenty of Controversy, Lee Gallagher. <laughs> And finally, Town and Country Real Estate President and CEO, Judy Desiderio. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll open with a specific question for each one of our panelists. Uh, we ask you please to try to keep your answers to two minutes, or under two minutes. Uh, after that, we will open up questions to the floor. So get your questions ready. We're going to start with Jay. Um, <coughs> Southampton Town recently agreed to uh, temporarily rescind the ban on short-term rentals for major regional events. The town board has already done so, for example, with the U.S. Open. Uh, but what other types of events do you foresee qualifying for the, such a waiver? All right, so uh, l let me first say in terms of background. So I bring to the table a couple things. One as supervisor of Southampton, prior supervisor of East Hampton, 12 years at the legislature, but also, um, I'm in the hotel industry as well. So um, these issues of short-term rentals have been on my mind for a very long time. Um, the town of Southampton, as was mentioned before, actually used to have a 30-day minimum, and it switched it to two weeks. And the primary reason was so people could take uh, advantage of a, a tax incentive. You can rent your primary residence for two weeks ta without any tax consequence. And, you know, today with, you know, the elimination of salt taxes as, uh, or the capping of salt tax deductions, um, 
it, it's a good place to basically have some savings. So, um, so recently, we looked at the US Open was in Southampton um, years ago, not, not that many years ago, but we didn't have the, uh, the rental law in place at that point, uh, the rental permit. And uh, lots of people, lots of local people, we're not all affluent, made money renting their homes. People who normally never rent their homes would, um, they were getting numbers, you know, $10,000 a week, $20,000 a week. It was an opportunity basically for people to share the wealth, so to speak, of the US Open. And a lot of people took advantage of it. Now we have this um, requirement that you need a rental permit and two weeks is the minimum rental. And I recognize that a lot of people wanted to um, be able to benefit from the US Open coming back to town. And I didn't want to turn everybody into lawbreakers. So um, I introduced a provision into the code that basically said for regionally important events as determined by the town board, um, the town could waive the, the two week minimum provision and allow a shorter term rental. And uh, once that law was in place, uh, we took the, the low-hanging fruit, the U.S. Open, and we said, okay, this is, the U.S. Open was asking for this relief as well because it just was not enough hotel capacity um, to have this event. This event brings hundreds of millions of dollars in economic activity into our community. And so we, uh, we did pass the provision allowing the U.S. Open. Um, so what other ones? I mean, I think we would consider the Hampton Classic. I think that's a major regional event that brings a lot of people in. Again, we don't have a, enough capacity. Other events, um, I, none that jump out immediately, but if, uh, some, what, the film festival? Film festival could be one that's more of a, more in East Hampton than in South Hampton, but that's a possibility too. So, so I would you know, entertain that kind of thing. But we are also gonna look at, uh, you know, I've been studying policies around the country in terms of short-term rental policy, and I'm sure this question will come up later, but you know, this started the conversation, this uh, exemption for the US Open. A lot of people have come to me and said, well, why, why, what's the difference between two weeks and one week? Why, what's the magic of two weeks? And, telling me that the market for families is really that one week market and trying to figure out a way to maybe manage this in a way that uh, protects communities, uh, protects neighborhoods, but also allows some income for people who may be struggling to make ends meet. Let me ask you a quick, a quick, uh, quick follow up question to that. What kind of response has there been so far to um, uh, the shorter uh, time period to allow for the, for US, the Open? U.S. Open. Yeah, I've heard no negative feedback whatsoever. Have, 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 have there been no a lot opposition. of people who said I, I'd like to participate? A lot more people are signing up for those rental permits because okay. you still have to have a rental permit. Yeah. You, you have to have that to take advantage. And it might be the only time you ever rent. Right. Right? It's just for the U.S. But Open. For grand, it could be, be worth it. For, yeah, some, a lot more in some cases. Thanks, Jay. Okay. Uh, Scott, a question for you. Um, in 2015, the town of Southhold enacted a ban on stays fewer than 14 days in homes in residential neighborhoods. What led the town to enact that legislation? What have been its successes and failures? Sure. Um, actually, what had happened was there had been a growing concern in the community over the presence of short-term rentals. We culminated in legislation in 2015. Uh, we had a lot of revisions, a great deal of discussion, community discussion, and I have to say very contentious discussion. It was a way to respond to what the community review um, viewed as a commercialization of our residential areas. I think one of the myths, maybe, was that it was a, a way to address problem housing, people that were noisy uh, and disruptive, and that just wasn't the case in Southall. There are those, there was those, uh, there were those houses that presented a problem, but we have legislation and books to address that. We have a noise code and everything else. Ultimately, the community had, it was an unease with the people coming and going. Uh, they've invested in residential communities. They had an anticipation that they'd be living in a community with other houses. When they started to see the turnover, they started, you started to see a growing concern. Then you had uh, the motel industry, the hotel industry, B&Bs weighing in and saying, where's the level playing field here? We've gone through a process. We live under a pretty regulatory environment. And then we have these short-term rentals popping up and competing with us. The, um, one of the things I would say about the short-term rental law is that primarily it's been successful. One of the challenges in any new code you're going to pass is code enforcement. That's the reality. But what people have to remember is that when you first adopt code, you do get substantial compliance. 
w after the compliance phase, then you can boil down your resources for code enforcement to those who simply aren't compliant. In Southold, I think we have 43, well, let me just go back and say, ultimately, we had about estimated 640 short-term rentals by the time we adopted the law. Um, now, we're, I'd say we're probably seeing about 40 or 50 that are operating. At, look, it's we do have some that operate under the radar. We do have 43 pending violations issued. We have not issued any fines, even though the first offense is 5,000, subsequent offense is 10,000, because we have been getting compliance after the notice of violation has been going out. I, uh, it's still a challenge, uh, you know, where the public has been our greatest resource in locating these houses. They're very efficient at getting a hold of us. Um, with that, uh, I would, you know, I'd be glad to talk about the history of it. Um, and I g have to say, again, the public discussion was probably the most brutal discussion I had in 12 years as supervisor. Wow. Thanks very much, Scott. Uh, one of the things I'd like you, to, as I was listening to Scott, uh, think about as we're going along here is uh, what the difference was. At we, we've, we've, we live in a resort area that's been a resort area for 100 and some odd years. Um, what's the difference in 20... 18 than in uh, 1918 or, uh, or or even 1960 or 1970. I think, and I'm going to ask Lee a quick question here. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing the answer is going to be uh, the uh, the uh, ad the advent of d uh, digital reservations uh, and apps like this. What Lee? What just quickly? What year did um, Airbnb hit its stride? Do you think? Uh, it was founded in 2007, sort of informally got off the ground in 2008 and really in 2009 started to gain momentum. And so just a broad question for those of us who are elected officials here, um, is that roughly around the time where this thing became such an issue that there was so much pressure put on the communities? Would that be a fair thing to say? I mean, that's any any. Well, would have been before. after that. It started in cities primarily, so yep. by the time it was probably more like 10, 2010, 2011, even after that. Um, okay. Not to answer the question. There's, there's no question that a, you know, a homeowner would have had a challenging time finding people to rent the home short term. Well, there were all the these newspapers. Right, and but in the newspapers, that's an expensive way. So you have to advertise. Oh. Let's say in New York City. <laughs> In the New York Times and the whatever the small ins and lodges pages in the old days, it yeah, was expensive, yeah. and that, so um, homeowners really couldn't take advantage of that. Um, but we've had rental issues throughout. So uh, Hampton Bays is a good example where you had a, a lot of share houses mm -hmm. in the past, long before Airbnb, where young people would pack these houses, and and the towns passed laws, ordinances to um, make it so you couldn't do that, and they cracked down pretty heavily. Um, in doing that. So we've had rental issues throughout. It's not always short term. It could be an entire summer, but packed with mm -hmm. 20 or 30 people, you know, living in bed. So it's the term of the rental may not be as much the issue in terms of who's there and how they're using the house. Okay. Jeff, uh, I'm going to go on to Jeff. Um, in late 2015, the town of East Hampton adopted a rental registry uh, in an effort to curb abuse of its existing short-term rental law, which limits homeowners to rentals of less than two weeks to twice every six months. How effective has the registry been, and does the board think it needs to be tweaked at all? Uh, it seems to be working pretty well, actually. We, it, it's not a new idea. We took a look at uh, what Southampton had done, and actually, actually our law is, I think, slightly less, um, uh, there's slightly, it, it's less restrictive, there's not as much enforcement. They have, a, they have one provision where you can lose the right to collect your rent if you don't comply. We, don't, we didn't want to go that far. Um, it seems to be working relatively well. I mean, I, my first experience with it was before I was on town board, and actually I was one of the few attorneys who deals in real estate that stood up in favor of the law in the midst of a bunch of brokers who were worried about it. Um, and I, I didn't really understand <laughs> that. <laughs> I'm not the only one here. <laughs> I'm sure there are many brokers here. Now, I, actually, I thought it, you know, in, in some way a rental registry uh, cured one of the problems uh, that we get had from Airbnb, which, which was the anonymity and the difficult of tracking down uh, people that weren't complying with um, our limitations on short-term rentals. And to me, I, it seemed like a fairly reasonable way to um, level the market and take away 
um, some of the advantage that Airbnb had just because it could operate uh, on its own through its apps, and it was very hard to penetrate and find out who owned houses. It looks to me, I looked at the enforcement uh, data for this last year, we have about 22 cases that went to court and were resolved in court, which is not a, not a high level. And I think really what East Hampton has always felt and continues to feel is that the most important thing we have is to perpetuate a feeling that we're a community of homes and of people that are committed to the area and that have some connection to the locality. That doesn't mean you have to have been born and raised here. You could have a second home here. But you know we find that people that view themselves as residents of the community uh, do better as citizens and, and make our town a little bit more of the character that we like. And that was our concern about Airbnb, was the, the, the turnover. I think, the, I think what triggered the uh, attention was probably some of the party houses that Scott was talking about or that Jay referenced. Mm -hmm. But really the long-term risk that we saw would be uh, that, it, that it could change the character of the community as, as a, a community of homeowners mm -hmm. and you know, children and families, and we want to keep that. And it seems like the law is working and it's sort of self-executing, so it's, uh, it's Thanks. operating on its own. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Aiden, um, like many local villages, Sag Harbor has yet to enact a law regarding short-term rentals. Uh, is the town, uh, is the village board considering legislation? And if so, uh, what is that starting to look like? Uh, we are considering legislation, and we've had uh, one uh, public work session where we discussed that. Um, our discussions have lent, uh, are leading us in similar places to where Jay and, and Scott have been with their legislation. Uh, we're looking at how the, rental, how the short-term rental market is going to affect the character of our village. We recognize that everybody traditionally has rented homes out here to make ends meet, to send kids to college, and for a variety of other reasons, and that's something that we support. However, we are concerned as to how short-term rentals change the nature of a neighborhood, and we live cheek by jowl here in Sag Harbor, so for us, it's very much more immediate. Um, we like to know our neighbors, we like to know what's going on on our street, and we believe that a short-term rental situation where you have different people in the next door neighbor's house, which may be like feet from your front door, um, changes the character and changes the quiet enjoyment that you deserve of your home. So what we're trying to establish is a balance. Um, to go back to your earlier, one of the earlier questions as to how Airbnb Airbnb managed to or to create this micro market, so to speak. Mm. In a sense, Airbnb and VRBO and HomeAway create their own communities outside of our community. So if you use their websites, you feel part of a community. It's different than advertising through a newspaper. You know, you get to say hi to somebody. They have a little background. There's a bio there. You you see their likes. You see where they've been. You see they've got five star ratings from other people. So there's a comfort factor that's built up there. And so they've managed to create an environment where you can make a very short-term rental financially viable because the overhead involved in executing the transaction is almost minimal compared to meeting a broker, getting in the car, looking at a house, going through that process. You just can't do that for 48 hours. One of my big fears is sort of the last-minute rental where you have a group of people sitting around Manhattan or wherever on Thursday night. They go online. They go, hey, there's a house available. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And suddenly they show up in Sac Harbor. They take up, the, they take, they use the village without ever participating in the village. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there is anecdotal evidence that with the rise of Airbnb, there has been a certain fall off in trade on Main Street. That could be you, 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 due to a number of reasons, um, but uh, this is no, no doubt a contributing factor. So what we're looking at, and we're looking at best practices that have gone on around in, other in the other towns and villages, is how do we protect people's rights to rent their home and also protect their neighbors' rights to the quiet enjoyment of their home? So I hope at some stage, uh, as, this pro as this conversation progresses, that we'll take some public input. And I, I expect that it will be pretty divided. I remember last year on Shelter Island, there was a town hall meeting on this subject, and I think it was pretty much 50-50 split as to whether there should be any regulation at mm. all, it should be the Wild West, or it should be shut down. Mm. Mm. So it's going to be interesting. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I think yeah. we all have the best uh, interest of the village at heart. Thank you. Actually, one of the, you made a point about its effect on Main Street. One of the reasons that this particular panel was impaneled is just for that, because we were hearing that there was an impact on Main Street and commerce that you didn't have 
that people who were short-termers uh, or short-timers, weekenders, didn't have the same investment, either emotional or, or literal investment, uh, on Main Street. So I, think, I think that's really true. I think if you're here or if you're anywhere for a weekend, you sort of skip along the surface. If I'm here for two weeks, and two weeks is the time frame that we're sort of yeah. coalescing around for no other reason than it feels, feels right, um, I'd be willing to hear other, other ideas on time. But I think if you're here for two weeks, you get to shop, you get to go to the grocery store, you get to partake of village life, and you get to see a certain amount of the important rhythm of the village repeat itself as it mm -hmm. does day after day, and you get the different nuance of a weekend, as opposed to showing up on Friday, out of here Sunday, great weekend, good party. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, uh, show of hands, who among us has actually ever used Airbnb or VRBO or HomeAway? About, oh, I'd say about 60%, right? Wow. Uh, Lee, question for you. Uh, your book tells the behind-the-scenes stories of the creation and growth of Airbnb, which in under a decade became the largest provider of accommodations in the world. You address the success of the community, uh, as of the company, as well as the controversy and disruption it has caused. Can you tell us how the company responded to your research, both in terms of its success and to its image, fair or not? as a disruptor. Sure, first I want to say thanks to you, Brian, and to Gavin and the Sag Harbor Express for having me. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I am the author of the book on Airbnb, but I'm also a longtime Sag Harbor renter. <laughs> so I've been renting houses here in the summer, in the winter, since 2003. Uh, last night I stayed here at the American Hotel. But I did take myself out to a nice dinner at Lulu's, even though I'm only here for one night. <laughs> We need to spend money, too. <laughs> we need to eat, <laughs> even us short-termers. Um, anyway, it's, it's so complicated. Uh, and I should also say, my rentals have been, I tallied them up last night, four through a traditional real estate broker, two through friends, I mean long-term rentals, uh, one through VRBO for a month, and two through Airbnb, one for one night uh, a few years ago, one last summer for two weeks uh, here in Sag Harbor. Anyway, just for the record, for context, I'm sort of a the other side of the story, I guess, in many ways. But um, so Airbnb responded, how did they respond? Uh, I approached them in 2015. I had written a profile of the CEO, Brian Chesky, for Fortune magazine. And I was just really fascinated by this, just this story. I mean, I'm a journalist. I like stories. This story had everything in it. It was disruption. It was rags to riches. It was nobody ever thought it was going to work. No one ever thought this was going to work. And so uh, I thought there really was a book here. And the first thing, they were incredibly, still are, um, flattered that somebody would be so interested in them to write a book about them. They were very taken by that. I mean, they, they were very surprised, let alone that somebody from Fortune magazine would write about them. I mean, they were, I, it always surprised me how kind of flattered they were about that. Um, so, but then the, the second thing that Brian Chesky said to me after that was, well, we're just getting started. So any book you write now is gonna be very outdated very quickly. Uh, that's true in some ways, but my book focuses a lot about the origins and the history and why it took off, and those things are not going to change no matter where the company goes from here. Um, their Im oh, by the way, Taylor also, I promised Taylor I would say, we're going to have a little book signing at Harbor Books after this, so she's got some, some of the books. She was very generous to do that. Um, so the disruptor thing. Uh, they hate being called disruptors. Brian Chesky always flinches when he's publicly called that. He always says, uh, oh, that's what I was called in school. I think that has a negative connotation. We're not disruptors. I don't want to be called that. That, And he, he's always gone out of his way to say that uh, the conventional uh, topic here is Airbnb versus the hotels specifically, less so the, the residential communities in, in places like uh, Sag Harbor and, and out here. But um, he says, you know, for us to win, no one has to lose. That's what he says a lot. And he, they've been on the surface trying to say that everybody can coexist. Airbnb brings a different kind of consumer. It's not taking away. Now, we all know that that's not true. When it comes to Airbnb and hotels, Airbnb is, is selling ho rooms for the night. I mean, that's what hotels do too. So to say they don't compete is, and I think most people realize that. Um, and they are disrupting. They're incredibly disruptive. Uh, but I think, um, so the, I, let me just back up for a second. The other part of that, the other half of that equation is they say publicly they don't want to be called that, but behind the scenes and just if you look at what they're doing and they, their relationship with the hotel industry and vice versa, it's become very, very negative. And um, I think they are uh, very happy with what they, I mean, they're thrilled with the way the company has 
grown, obviously, they very much see themselves as a, um, there's, they have this idealism around what they do where they're bringing people together. Um, it's about humanity, it's about belonging, it's about community, as you said, Aiden. They take this to the nth degree in their marketing materials like you would not imagine, but it is a large reason why people, especially millennials, really like it. People do gravitate towards that. I was suspicious of, of that being a big hook for Airbnb when I first started reporting the book. It is a big deal. Uh, so they see them, they literally call themselves at one point the UN at the kitchen table. Like they think they're bringing people together from all different kinds of cultures and solving world peace. Um, wow. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. uh, I don't know, that's a good question. <laughs> Uh, so it's complicated, like a lot of things with Airbnb, but I think that the one thing, to take the hotel industry as an example, one thing that they've learned is that, listen, there was an appetite for this. It's exploded. You don't get this kind of growth. 300 million trips have been taken on this platform. Two million people spent the night in an Airbnb this New Year's Eve alone without striking some chord in the consumer and in the zeitgeist. And so hotels are finally coming to realize that, hey, let's claim some of this for ourselves too. And they're doing that in a number of different ways that we can talk about while still fighting Airbnb on the regulatory front. Um, so that's okay. my first statement, I guess. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, Judy, uh, you've been a real estate professional on the East End for more than 30 years, uh, and, and although you don't look it, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and opened your firm Town & Country in 2005. Can you explain to us what the rental market looked like in terms of availability and affordability when you started Town & Country 13 years ago compared to what it looks like today? That's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, way back when, even before 2005, uh, the norm was Memorial Day through Labor Day, and the one-month rentals were the exception to the rule. And that was a very happy place for those of us who live here and those of us who visit. Because as Aiden said, when you're here for, I would say a month versus two weeks, when you're here for a month, you do go grocery shopping, and you do go into the communities, and you do visit the different shops, and you, and you are a part of the community. But if you're there short term, you're in and you're out, and that's it, and you usually bring your mother, your father, your uncle, your cousin, everybody's dogs, everybody's cars, and before you know it, the infrastructure to our beautiful little communities has been bastardized. And those of us who live here, don't come to the American Hotel in the summer, or we don't go to our favorite restaurant, or we don't go out because it's a disaster. Sag Harbor is the most vibrant village, congratulations, but did you ever try to drive through it on the 4th of July weekend or Labor Day weekend? I mean, i take a boat just to go around it. So, in, I, I saw that. <laughs> so in answer to your question, the norm was something we all lived harmoniously with. And then it really wasn't Airbnb, although they probably want to take the credit for it, it was really the perfect storm between the stock market crash, and it was a crash in 2008, which changed the way everyone vacationed, no matter where you went. Everybody who used to be Memorial Day through Labor Day said, eh, honey, let's go for a month. And the people who went for a month said, eh, let's go for a week. But eventually, they started to come back, because living in the concrete jungle for the entire summer is really hard. So cheaper than therapy, you come out to the Hamptons, you stick your feet in the water and you feel better. So I, I'm, I'm happy to say that the past couple of years, the extended stays have been longer. But 2008 was the year, and I think that's when you identified, or Brian, you did, that that's when Airbnb started to really, so we have, and it's not just Airbnb, it's VRBO, it's Home Away, it's all the rest of those aggregates. And what they did was they gave to the general public the opportunity, as you wrote in your book, to e experience maybe an area and something they would never have experienced. We can't turn back the tide. We are an ever-evolving, thanks to technology, um, vacation club. That's what we are. And we hate to say it if you live here, but we're a resort town. You said it before, and you're absolutely right. Um, we'd like to say we own it and we keep it and it's never going to change. That's so wrong. It's changing every single day and it's going to continue to change. And thankfully, the people in office every year sit down and say, okay, what worked and what didn't work? <coughs> and um, for, the, for the record, <laughs> brokers are not opposed to the rental registry or the rental permits. It's when you make us responsible 
such as in our ads, we have to have this number on there. I'm not the owner. I can't make them go get the permit. By you telling me I can't advertise it, you've now impeded my business. So I'm 100% for, and I think if you ask the brokers around, they'll tell you it's a good thing. We should know who's renting because there is no code enforcement. So those of us who live here, when you're living next door to a house that's been rented 15 times a year, you're stuck dealing with it. What would you like to be the, what would you like the municipalities to do? What would you like the governments to do? Personally or yeah. professionally? Well, <laughs> 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 well, professionally. I think the rental registry and the permit process is a good one. Southampton, frankly, the permit's about this thick and it's too expensive. It should be more like East Hampton, a couple of pages, very simple. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, but you guys still require like a blueprint of the house, uh, right? For that initial permit, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're trying to streamline the As renewal. simple as possible. Make it short, make it sweet, make it cheap, and everybody will do it. Jay, I really think in Southampton, maybe 20% of the, the people who rent their homes have uh, um, a permit. But you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> Not at all. And, and Jeff, I think what East Hampton did is great, but there's no enforcement. When, when, uh, unless there's a complaint and it goes to trial, then, then there's enforcement. But when you pull up to your house and next door to you, there's way more than four cars and way more than four unrelated people, that's a pain in the butt. And if they're there, as I said before, for one week or two weeks, they're gonna bring everybody they know and every kid and every dog and every car and you know what they're going to do? They're going to bring a tray of lasagna. They're going to bring sandwiches. They're not going to go to the restaurants the way Lee did and we do. But, uh, but they're not going to be a part of the community. So if there's a way, honestly, I think two-week minimum because of the, the tax law makes sense. Encourage 30-day rentals. Under two weeks, I, I don't think our area can accommodate it. Okay. Our roads are completely over, overgrown. Thanks, Judy. Uh, so I need to give uh, uh, Jeff and Jay an opportunity to quickly respond to <laughs> that, uh, if, you, if you can. And then uh, I'm going to uh, start looking for questions from the audience. Jay, you want to go first? And please keep this well, brief. You know, in, in terms of a lot of people renting without rental permits, um, which would violate our law, and it could be that the length of the permit is an impediment. And I obviously want to see everybody who's renting have the necessary permit. So uh, it's something I will take a look at in trying to streamline it. I know East Hamptons is much simpler, though uh, they're talking about making, you know, collecting more information on theirs. At least that's what I've heard. Jeff can con confirm that. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, Southampton has that two week minimum. East Hampton has basically two less than two weeks every six months, something like that. Um, I think there really should be some provisions for less than two weeks, but it really, but not too often. So you don't want a house constantly turning over. But I think you know there are times when um, I, I found that the market is really has changed. And not only are there very few people looking for the whole season, there's very few people looking for a month. There's very few people looking for two weeks. The market for families tends to be that one week market. That's what they can afford. That's what their vacation is. Um, so I, I, you know, I think if you're limited to two weeks, you're still going to end up with a lot of one weeks. And Airbnb, if I have time, they shared a letter with me as well about how many people they have on their platform. I think it's like 800 homes that are listed on Airbnb. And the average stay seems to be only about three days, but it's primarily families. And mm. um, you know, I think, as uh, Scott said earlier, we got to just find that the right formula that protects the character of the community, where these things should occur. Maybe not everywhere, but maybe areas where we're trying to promote tourism, or maybe you don't have to, maybe it's a commercial zone, or a main corridor. Um, Shelter Island was mentioned. They just passed their law, and um, their rental permit does not apply on 114. So there you, they're basically recognizing that Route 114, you can get to a house without having to go through a neighborhood. So right. thanks, Jay. So di different. I diff think it's a different uh, formula for every community, perhaps. I, Jeff, I I'm going to give you an opportunity to uh, respond to the lack of enforcement in the town. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't. S I wouldn't say there's lack of enforcement. I think we've had a, a lighter touch with it, and I think it seems to be working relatively well. What draws attention are the houses where they gang a bunch of people together and they get noisy and they turn into party houses. 
But I, I wanted to make a comment about Airbnb changing the market because I, I debated this in uh, during the campaign, and that was one of the points my opponents were making is, you know, this is the way the market's going and we have to go with it. And my answer, and I think East Hampton's answer is no, we don't, we do not have to let the market control our community. We can do something to control the market. And um, I know it's a little bit of a pain to get those numbers in your ads, but it's a really critical element of, of our town's ability to retain its small town family character because we need that number to, to track people who are violating um, the substantive law that's behind the rental registry, which is the limitation on length of stay and the number of times you can have short-term rentals. I think the consensus in East Hampton is pretty strong that um, despite the convenience of these short-term rentals, these weak rentals, we don't want to go there. And we think that as a municipality and as elected officials that we have the right to regulate this market. And I think it's a fair uh, interaction between us and Airbnb because they came in in a way under the radar of a lot of zoning restrictions. And you know, in, in East Hampton we've learned, and I've known since 1984 from fighting many zoning battles, that these battles continue. They come back and this is not good for our community. These short-term rentals don't work here. We don't need to encourage tourism in the town of East Hampton. We know that. We just had a state initiative where we they're trying to ask us to, to join them. I don't think, I, I, Jay, I know I, I've seen a lot of, st I've spent a lot of time in Montauk this summer and I, my, my b best bumper sticker from Montauk is make, make Montauk the way it was, not make it, not the, what's becoming. And, and Montauk is a lot happier with the town of East Hampton and I know this from being in Montauk at CCOM meetings. They're a lot happier when, because East Hampton has cracked down on these short-term rentals and on the clubs and made it a quieter town. And we're doing a good job on it. And it, you just ask ask them on the street. In Thank Montauk. you, Jeff. Really, uh, I'm, I'm just going to let uh, I'm just going to let lead, uh, and then I want to uh, open it up to the audience. I really just wanted on. you know I was Jay, just really responding you, to the okay. issue of the well, tourism. Me. East Hampton doesn't want tourism. Um, Montauk depends a lot on tourism. That's all. I'll say. Okay. I just wanted to make um, three three counterpoints. Uh, just and I'm not speaking on behalf of Airbnb. I just want to make that clear. These are not really Airbnb counterpoints. But uh, number one, I mean, there's a lot of talk about the crazy partiers happening, and that being a big big part of the reason that short-term rentals are not wanted. But as Judy mentioned, and a few others have, I mean, as long as I've been coming out here renting, I was offered to do these share houses for a long time. I never wanted to do that, but that was part of the long-term rental business, the share houses, where it's, it's um, you know, these huge houses are rented by one party, they subdivide them, and I'm sure you obviously know about that. So I don't think that's exclusively an Airbnb problem. Those houses can get very loud also. Um, I've had cases where those houses are next to me when I've been out here. Um, also, just again, for the record, I came here for two weeks last year, rented a house for two weeks, and I bought a full season long beach pass because I'm dying to use the beach. I mean, I, and you know, I spent so much money at that IGA you know, because <laughs> um, it's great. But uh, the other point I want to make about that is my dear friends who have rented Memorial Day to Labor Day for a really long time here until they moved to Boston a few years ago, uh, uh, they, when once Fresh Direct came out, they were Fresh Direct all the way. And that is just another example of how technology is all around us. It's changing everything. I mean, mm -hmm. the CEO of Macy's has to contend with rent the runway, telling people to rent clothes instead of buy them. And so... You know, these are real issues that are totally disruptive and that, you know, we have to find a way to deal with some way or another because they're not going to go away, which everyone on this panel agrees. And then the last thing I'll say is uh, it's surprising to me as an out-of-towner who has come here for so long that there's such resistance to calling the East End a tourism community because look at you. I mean, look at the beaches here. Look at this setting. I mean, this is, uh, that's what, I mean, this is an incredibly desirable place. So. If that's going to be a problem, I mean, that, that's surprising to me to hear. I know nobody wants to be only tourists, but um, this is like, you know, heaven out here for somebody who doesn't live here. Thanks, Lee. I'm going to uh, start taking... Not a Barry has a question. I'm just going to uh, steal your... <laughs> I think you started us off last week also. Well, I may have. Um, anyhow, there are pluses and minuses, as we know, to everything. But I uh, have a business that's going into its 50th year on Main Street. And I want to just say that 
the Airbnb people I know have been shopping with me, and I know the restaurants have been getting a pickup from it, and the takeout places. So you can't say that they don't support the community. I just I can see both sides of the question. Let's leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you have somebody else have a question? Jane? Uh, I'm Jane Holden, a lifelong resident of Sag Harbor, and I've been doing real estate here for 38 years. Um, what causes problems on Main Street are the buses that come just for a day. They're the people who bring their own lunches and only buy ice cream. Um, they might shop in your store, but most stores they don't. <laughs> but as a real estate broker with these new rental laws, I have told people, you know, our, I work for Brown Harris Stevens, and we will not take the listing if they do not comply and get the permits. And if you sit with them, which I've done more than once with the paperwork, and go through and take about half an hour, they're happy, and they do it. And the reason I get them to do it is I tell them about the lawsuits. There's one specific, specific one. It was over a $100,000 rental and the landlord was not giving back the security, so the tenant gave the paperwork to his friend who was an attorney, who took the time to look and see that this person had not gotten a rental permit. Well, guess what? The whole money went back. Everybody had to give up everything. And the same as with East Hampton wanting, it is annoying having to put the number in the ad. I agree with Judy on that. But we, if you take the time to tell the homeowner, I'm not jeopardizing my license to list your house if you won't get a permit. It's not that hard. I'll help you with it. But that's part of the problem. There's agents that don't want to take the time to explain the importance of it. Now, I've gone through the group rentals over in uh, Noyak and they went in the one time and there was a list on the refrigerator of 29 people and when they could stay and when they couldn't stay. It's, you, nobody wants that. Thanks, Jane. I saw somebody had their hand up over here. Hi, my name is Kathy Werner. Um, I live in Noyak. I have a small bungalow right up from Long Beach and I do hope to rent my home this summer for the U.S. Open and if you have the exclusion for the horse show. So on one side of it, I can see the need. But on the other side, I live next to a nightmare of a renter. And as a person that is scrimping pennies to survive out here, this person charges $662 a night. In Noyak, where there's all local people who get up and go to work. We have been complaining. I haven't lived there. Um, started in 2014. The police have been called multiple times. Limos, catering trucks, garbage, um, people throwing up on neighbors' property. I have been to, excuse me, Jay, but um, I have been to Southampton Town Hall for almost two years now. I have worked with the town attorney. I've been to your office. And this gentleman has hired Eddie Burke Jr., who I think was supposed to be at the table today. And he's like, this gentleman who offered me $5,000 not to get in trouble with the town anymore, which the town attorney knows, there's no code enforcement. Why would this gentleman, he's like, I can get away with it. Nobody is punishing me. Nobody is closing down my house. So uh, we can make all the laws in the world. We can all work with Airbnb, which I hope to, or a local realtor to rent my home. I'm going to do it the right way. And I expect other people to do. But when they don't, and there is proof that they don't, there has to be a consequence. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Jay, maybe you want to respond to that, uh, since it's kind of your neighborhood? <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll take what you have there. You know, you recently, uh, around September of last year, we re revamped our ordinance enforcement functions entirely. We brought in a new person uh, to head that department. And since that time, our notices of violations have doubled. Our field appearance tickets have doubled. So we are um, substantially have increased code enforcement in the town of uh, Southampton. I, so I, 
I can't say code enforcement doesn't exist. Code enforcement is is very active. Um, certainly, somebody who's flagrantly you know violating our law should not be allowed to get away with it. And these laws ought to be protecting the neighbors. I think that should be the main goal here. That whatever the policy is, it's one that allows people to enjoy their homes. So. I can understand somebody wanting to you know, make a little money to send their kid to college or help pay that mortgage and not lose the home, but it has this, that balance that we've talked about. So that obviously is way, t in, even in my mind, way too frequent an exchange. They, we have laws about how many people can live in a home or be in a home. It's supposed to be no more than four unrelated people and no more than four cars. So it seems like they are really taking advantage so I, you know, I will refer to code enforcement. That's the best I can do. But they have been pretty good about following up. So just call me. That's yeah. thank you, Jay. Uh, Russell. Good afternoon, Russell Cradival. I'm here as a resident of both Sag Harbor and Flanders, New York. Um, first of all, I want to compliment Jane. I think her comments about the real estate agency taking responsibility. If you're part of the community, and you have clients. I think it's important that you take responsibility and make sure that the people that you're representing or that you're getting money from um, follow the laws and the rules. And I compliment her. I think that's great. The other thing I think that's important is I just don't think that we ought to take the attitude that we don't want people here that don't meet our criteria exactly. Should they follow the laws? Absolutely, they should follow the laws. But. I don't want people here that can't afford to live here for two weeks. That creates an elitist society, and I don't think that's what we're looking for here. Okay, and with regards to how the short term is changing our um, downtowns and areas, I disagree. First of all, I do think, and I do see in the IJ market every Friday if I come in or Saturday, go in there Saturday morning early and watch the people who are here for the weekend and how full their cart is. But they bring up um, the, the, the young lady from Fortune, I can't remember her name, um, brings up a great point. What businesses need to do is adapt. The consumer is changing. Airbnb is a real thing. So hotels need to kind of get into that market. I see things even here in the American Hotel, how they are changing the way they do their menu. Okay? You need to attract the people who are coming. If your business is not making it in Sag Harbor, Take a look at your business model because the people are here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, somebody else? I see somebody. Brian, so, can I just answer about the yes, real estate course. broker? Yes, of course. Go ahead. Um, just so that everyone understands, from the beginning of time, and Jane, you know this because you worked with me, um, brokers are very clear that no more than four unrelated people are allowed in a house. Ellen, you worked for me too. Every lease, when we have a tenant, we tell every single lease, every resident in this house needs to be listed. We are part of this community. It is really important to us and we do uphold our end of the of the bargain. We can't we can't enforce things that we don't have control over, but the lease that we create and we tell every tenant, correct Jane, everyone who's on there. And if we see five names, six names, seven names, we say I'm sorry, I can't help you. You need to go somewhere else for your rental. We won't write this lease. Right, Jane? Right, Ellen? Jeff, uh, you wanted to uh, respond? I think there's a microphone right over there. I, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I don't think uh, being concerned about uh, the length of short rentals and limiting them to two-week rentals um, is elitist or that that answers the question. Um, th this is more than a dollars and cents equation here. And, you know, I've, as an attorney, I've gotten calls from clients in Sag Harbor that said, you know, that this Airbnb is killing my neighborhood every weekend or sometimes twice during a weekend. I see people, you know, looking for a picture on their phone trying to figure out what house they've rented. And it, it erodes the community character that makes uh, Sag Harbor and East Hampton, the attractive tourist destinations that they are. And I want to make it clear, I'm not saying we don't need tourists. We do, we do need tourists. We live on it. I was merely saying in East Hampton, our feeling on the town board is we don't need to promote tourism. We're known 
uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a blessing, but it's also a curse. And I think we have a right to protect the community we want, even if that bumps up against the latest you know, revision of the market that a clever you know, inventor can come up with on the Internet. Thanks, Jeff. We have one question over here. Tell us your name. Um, I'm Paulette Corsair, and I work with Nest Seekers International, and I used to work with Jane at, with, at, at Brown Harris Stevens for a few years. Um, my, my question um, for Judy was, well, not a question, just a statement. I have some other questions. Um, I do think that the people that are coming out here, like for the short-term rentals, are spending money on, on the um, restaurants and shopping and stuff like that. I'm out all the time. I see what's going on. I think they are spending the money. I think some of the locals don't like to spend money, like to go to the restaurants because they're very costly. We all know that. So I think that the people that are coming here for the two weeks are going out and spending money in the economy. And I have to say that I work on a lot of rentals and I have a friend that's looking to rent for a week and he's in finance and he does very well, sophisticated person with a family, looking to spend $30,000 for one week and I can't help him because, you know, he wants a house near the ocean to enjoy with his family, <laughs> with his new baby. And I, I, you know, I can't do anything for him. And, and believe it or not, there's a lot of those people out there that are like educated, sophisticated people, culture that want to come out here with their families and spend 50000 for a week, 20000 for a week. I mean, that's like good money. And guess what? We're losing that to Airbnb because we have a two-week minimum. I, I think that the time has come that it has to change. I'm not for short-term rentals for a weekend. I, I, I believe that that brings a different element. I used to do share houses when I was, when I was in my 20s, in the 90s, and I know what that's about, I know what that brings, but you know what? There's a lot of families that have money, that live in the city, that have a place in Palm Beach, that want to come out here for the summer for one week and enjoy their community and spend money, $40 an entree. You know, it's like we shouldn't be turning those people away because it's a law, because we can't change our laws. We have to change with technology. I'm happy to answer my portion, sure. and then you guys can go for the rest of it. I think that what you've heard from this panel is we need to find a balance. We're in this position because we're not Miami. We don't have these hotels, motel. We don't have places for people to come and visit our area. Southampton has one or two, but nothing really to accommodate the way that the population swells. So we are in this quandary. But you have to remember that the, the, the public wants to also maintain the quality of the area. So how do we find the balance? And that's why this discussion is going on. We hear everything, and, and they hear everything you say. Yeah. I'm sorry, go well, ahead. Well, you know, the agents, we screen people. Mm -hmm. Like I had somebody call me the other day. He wants to spend, I think, 30,000 for one month. And first, I'm like, how many people is it? How many pets, no pets? Seven people. I'm like, I can't, can't I can't do this. I'm like, because I, I, I thought it was five, no more than five unrelated people in town to South Hampton. Five in South you know Hampton, what, you know it's four in East me? Hampton. Oh, we're five. They lie to us. They lie to the agent. They lie to the agents, and then the homeowner comes back to us and is like, you told us it's only, it's only five people. We put the names on the lease, and they lie to us, and then it's ten people. So how can we be held responsible? You know, it's not our fault. Thanks. Uh, Ellen, you got a question? Hello, Ellen Stahl. I've used the Airbnb uh, multiple times with my family, and I think I see something changing that they've hit on it. And you've kind of, I don't want to say poo pooed it, but it was the idea that they're going to fix the world. What they have hit upon is we're all looking to make connections. And to go to a hotel or a motel, you go in, you go to bed. You hang out by yourself, you leave again. When we've used Airbnbs, I'd say 99% of the time they've been great. And in the mornings or in the evenings, you have a family who wants to talk to you if you want to talk. They want to share their experience. They want to share their town. They want to share where to shop, who to see, 
what theater to go to, and we've learned a lot from communities we would never have learned about had we just gone into a hotel, booked in, booked out, and just done our own thing. Thank you. Aiden, you want to say something? Yeah, I'd just like to um, respond to that a little bit and say that we would think of drawing a distinction between Airbnb rentals where the owner is present and where the owner is not present. I think they're two very, very different uh, situations. But we also have to be cognizant of the fact that he here in Sac Harbor, and I only speak for Sac Harbor, and I'm fortunate that I don't have any laws to defend because we're in the process <laughs> of gathering information and this, and, and, and this is a great opportunity. We have hotels, motels, and we have guest houses here. Um, for somebody who is inviting guests into the home on a regular basis, we have to decide at what stage has this ceased to be a residence and become a commercial enterprise. And what does that do for the neighborhood? We have zoning laws, and we all respect those because we all expect the quiet enjoyment of our homes. So this is a, a much bigger conversation that we need to have in Sag Harbor, and it's something that we hope to flesh out over the period of maybe the next five or six months. There'll be nothing in place for this year. This is really, I've learned coming from private industry to government that it ta everything takes an awful long time, um, which is not a bad thing. But we need to gather everybody, you know, we need to gather opinions and we need to figure out what's going on in the community. And like right now, as I said, we're in a sort of a two-week area for non-resident homeowners. And then the whole idea of inviting people into your home at night is a completely different question that we have to examine. Like what sort of restrictions do we put on that? Um, at what stage do you have to fulfill the requirements of a commercial of a commercial enterprise? And if that doesn't fit into the zoning of your neighborhood, should it be outlawed altogether? There's, um, and then the last thing I'll say on this, in a village like Sag Harbor where we, we live so close to each other, I think you need, when you talk about 114 on Shelter Island not having any registration required because it's essentially a commercial thoroughfare, um, we live in really tight neighborhoods here. And I think what our neighbors do has an awful lot uh, of impact on how we live our lives at home. And I think that needs to be considered. I do many other aspects of this. Can Lee. I just, yeah, I just want to chime in here. Yeah. Um, the same thing in New York City. New York City, by the way, Airbnb has had a tremendous amount of difficulty. I mean, there we are literally living like sardines, and so the neighbor issues become so er exacerbated when they are present. But um, one thing I encountered a whole lot of, which I think is very, very telling in any region I studied, any place where these issues have flared up, very few people want the Airbnb next door. But when they're on vacation, God damn, yeah. do they want the Airbnb. I mean, it's like, <laughs> pardon my French, uh, but it's like you can't have it both ways. But another point I want to make as well is that I think we're all in agreement, you know, nobody wants kind of partiers next door. I mean, that's where so many of these problems arise, or noise, or all the other kinds of violations. And um, Airbnb has had a tremendous amount of problems with discrimination, racial discrimination on its site. It was a huge issue a few years ago. They caught it. They tried to design ways to sort of ban it, get, you know, but this is the problem with a public platform. It's whatever is present in our society is going to find its way on that platform. But you are allowed to discriminate on what kinds of vacationers you want in your home if you're renting it out. I mean, you're allowed to say no to a bachelorette party and yes to a family with kids that are above the age where they cry. You know, I mean, you, you know, so I don't know that that's the answer, but it's a kind of an interesting thing. And of course, I think that also applies if you're renting through anyway. You get to you have some say in who comes into your home. Mm. No, of course, you also can't control when people are, are lying and, and not who right. they say they are. Thanks, Lee. We had a question right here. Just tell us your name. Um, my name is Sharon Einhorn. I have a business in Sag Harbor. And I want to point out that, I, and I've lived out here for 35 years and had a business here for 26 years. There's been a real change in Sag Harbor for businesses, and I understand that some businesses are doing well. Those are the businesses that are catering to people who are here for the day or a couple of days. They're buying ice cream, they're buying t-shirts, maybe they're buying toys. But our economy is not a tourist economy. It's a second home owner economy. And most businesses out here are servicing those second homeowners. So businesses that are selling furniture, businesses like the Five and Dime where people who used to rent for a month would go and buy towels, those businesses are really suffering. And I'm interested in hearing your point of view about the ramifications of changing us from a second home owner economy 
to a short-term rental economy, because that's what's happening. Uh, Aidan, maybe you want to try that? Well, I understand and I appreciate your concerns, and that's what we on the board are grappling with. And that's why we would hope to reach out to everybody and, and get this input. One of the things that I realized, I've been a board member for nine months now, is that what I think has very little to do with what actually should happen. And the idea of listening to people and finding out what everybody's condition is and what everybody's experience is is something that we have to consider. There are certain aspects of life that we can't push back against, but, we, but what we can try and do is manage it. Um, that's why I think a two-week rental, I'm, I, I am vehemently opposed to short-term rentals, period. I, in my mind, if, you know, if I was king, it would be two weeks. It seems right to me. It feels right. Um, other people have a different opinion, and that's why if we can gather our community together and come up with, not everybody will be happy, but I think we can find a consensus somewhere that's good for the village, that's good for the homeowners, good for business, good for the community. I agree, but I think also that's got to do with the, with the rental. I mean, you have to sell an awful lot of books, an awful lot of bread, an awful lot of coffee to pay the rent here, and that's something that's changed. Some of our finest stores, I know as a family, I have two kids, my wife sitting next to you, go, go to Pearson, we grew up, it was, you need something on a Saturday, let's go to the, I let's, let's go to the Five and Dime. If Five and Dime doesn't have it, let's go to Bridgehampton Commons. Bridgehampton Commons doesn't have it, we'll, we'll go online. But that's a responsibility that we all have to shop locally because if we want to maintain the nature of our community, it's something that w we just need to do. I also think that real estate has changed. I don't believe that, you know, that the, the five and dime could exist if they were paying rent to an absentee landlord. Um, so these are bigger issues than Airbnb. I think they're broader. A lot of this we have control over, but people have property rights. I'm not sure how long... A, an owner of a building would allow it to sit empty before it starts to affect their bottom line too and maybe the market's readjusting. But I agree with you and I find that empty, empty stores are a blight on the village and they tend to breed more empty stores and, and that's a, definitely a concern on the board. Thanks, Aiden. And Judy, you had a response and Jay. I do. If you, if you think Sag Harbor looks very sad in the winter, take a walk down East Hampton's Main Street. It's the saddest little village and it's my village. And I would say more than 50% of the core business district is closed. And it's awful. And what happens now is people don't even do holiday shopping there. They'll go to Southampton. And now Southampton got the disease. All of a sudden this year, they have stores that are closed. I think we have much bigger fish to fry. It goes way beyond this conversation. But this is a tough conversation. And I think we're ever evolving as villages go because of the fact that we are a resort town and we're just wrapping our minds around that to begin with. And then we have to couple that with the fact that we don't have hotels and motels. We'd have nowhere for people to come for the weekend. And when you're a resort town and you have nowhere for people to come in the weekend, what do you have going on? Illegal activity. Because all of the towns are saying one to two weeks. People are coming for the weekend whether we like it or not. And your 30,000 guy on the ocean, he can't rent a $10 million house for $30,000 for one week? Who's going to vacate that house? <laughs> Thanks, Judy. So uh, Jay, you want to respond? Well, first, a comment on downtown, because yeah, there are a lot of empties, and I, I don't think Airbnb is, is to blame for that. I think a different internet enterprise, uh, Amazon.com, is to blame for that. Retail all over the place is struggling from County Road 58 and Riverhead to all of our downtowns. And um, people are just buying more and more online. I, I also want to comment on this one-size-fits-all policy. It, it doesn't really work. So like Southampton's a big area. There are divides uh, north and south of the highway. There are divides east and west of the canal. Um, west of the canal, it tends in general to be more year-round and more seasonal east of the canal. But areas like Hampton Bays, they want more tourism. They think that if they could have more tourism, it would help the stores and the restaurants. So they are actively looking for shorter term rentals. Maybe their one week would be perfect. It would be affordable. They have great beaches and great places to shop. So you know, what makes sense for Hampton, Hampton Bays may not make sense for Northwest Woods. Um, so I, you know, I think we have to look at the area, the character of that area, and what the community wants, and then craft uh, legislation that will allow those things. And I think there are a number of considerations in developing a rental policy 
um, that need to be looked at. You know, I, I mentioned before quality of life. Um, one area I know they allow it, but you have to notify. If you get a, a short-term rental permit, you have to notify all of your neighbors that you have it. You have to provide them an emergency contact number. If they have any questions, you have to be able to respond within two hours. So I've been looking at various legislation throughout the country to see how other communities are dealing with this. And you know, there's a lot of ways that people are addressing the very concerns that you guys are expressing in this room. So you know, I'm certainly willing to work with you know, everybody in trying to come up with various policies that would make sense in different communities. Thanks, Jay. We have a question over here. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matt Egozi, and try this microphone. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi. My name is Nat Egozi. Um, Aiden, I also vehemently am opposed to less than two weeks. I also own the Sag Harbor Inn Hotel here on West Water Street, and resident here of Sag Harbor. Like some of you, many of you here, are also lifelong here. And I could tell you that um, things have changed here quite a bit over the years, and there's definitely a need to have a balance here and have some kind of regulation that puts things into perspective. Uh, Jay, it was interesting to hear the comment about uh, the change to allow for the U.S. Open, for example, people to rent. That has not helped my business at all. So in some instances, doing certain things for every action is a reaction and there's a balance, but to get that balance, you need to communicate the business owners that are directly affected, which is me, you know, the hotel, and some of the other business owners, like from the chamber, and understand what is the impact. So it's this, I want to thank the Say Harbor Express for holding this kind of forum. It provides an opportunity for someone like me to be able to communicate how it impacts my business in the hotel. Airbnb has been very negative and very disruptive to our business. It's also been personally disruptive to me, because I live in Redwood, and for, some of you know where Redwood is. Okay, so if you know where Redwood is, it's a small little island, so to speak, off the village. I've grown up there, been there my entire life, and one day I see a person on the side of the road pulling a roll away and just walking down the street into Redwood, and it was raining. I decided to give that person a ride to see where they were going, like, well, what's this person doing here in Redwood with a pull away? And it was an Airbnb story that I got, and she didn't know I'd own the hotel. Just, we just passed it, right? And I was having a conversation with her, and I started to realize that in my own, next to my own home in Redwood, there must have been 25 homes that were listed on Airbnb. So now it impacts me also personally as well from a business point of view, and better explains why when I'm in Redwood, I look around, I see all these cars everywhere, music, garbage, and so on. I think about the environmental impact here. So Aiden, as you're thinking about the village ordinance here, local ordinance, is also think about how in a transient use, it's within the village ordinance that you need to be connected to a sewer because we're using a lot of water and a lot of you know, laundry and a lot of, of showers and so on, we're connected to the sewer. If you're not connected to the sewer, where does that water go? Where does it go, okay? And where does your garbage go? We have compaction services. And also if you're transient, it's, it's regulated by the building code to have fire sprinklers in your building. This building has fire sprinklers, our hotel has fire sprinklers. You're in these homes, Airbnb situation, some of these places are fire traps, and it's not a good thing. We have a volunteer fire department. Do we need more of that? So that's another issue. And then as far as parking, we have off-street parking. Where's the off-street parking associated with these rental units when cars are lined up and they're all down the street? And some of these streets are very narrow. You can't even pass. So the ability to ride a bicycle or get around town or walk, it's kind of an impact t to us because if there's no enforcement, you can't enforce an ordinance that doesn't exist, so you have the ordinance and at least you have some basis to uh, go forward with it. So the gentleman from Southhold, I compliment you if it have had a very difficult political event to go through that process, but you have it, and I, I was interested to hear about how you have, uh, you're up to like 40 only about 40 folks that are kind of in that market right now. And I was also interested to hear how Airbnb wrote a nice letter to the Sag Harbor Express talking about thousands of people have been through Sag Harbor. Well, those thousands of people didn't come to our hotel. And that, in turn, it completely impacted and been somewhat disruptive here. So I have concerns, and I thank you know, the Express for 
having this kind of forum to be able to communicate them. Thank you. Thank you, Nat. Um, David, you had a question? Okay, um, I'm sorry. Basically, my question goes to how do you level the playing field? You know, I'm sitting next to Nat, he has a hotel, okay? I have a shop on Main Street here, Lisa, the five and 10, who's been an example for almost everybody today. But two things, one thing I wanna just correct something before it goes on. I've been a professor for 29 years at FIT, okay? Let me point something out. The number of retail sales done online is 10%. Okay, 90% of sales is still done in stores. So the internet is not the problem, okay? The other thing is people that say the stores are crowded, crowds do not translate to the register, okay? Well, that's one key thing. Yeah, they might be crowded, but we're not making the same number we used to make. But when it comes to Airbnb, and say I'm sitting here next to Nat, he collects taxes. Who collects the taxes when an Airbnb is rented? Okay, the owner is supposed to, but quite frankly, we're all agents of the state collecting sales tax. I can't operate my store without doing that. Why can't Airbnb become an agent to collect the tax? This way you actually do get a record of who's renting. Then your compliance, your enforcement is all handled through the companies that are doing the rentals. Matt does it, I do it with my business, Lisa does it with her business, I think it can be done with them. Thank you, David. Uh, Do you want me to? Is it Scott? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on, just a quickly, uh, in our experience in Southall. First, I do have to say, you asked a question um, a while ago about what's the difference between, say, 1918 and 2018. In Southall, not much. Um, <laughs> um, just there, there, there's just a couple of things. First, I want to say when I hear the word um, sharing economy, I cringe a little bit. Um, in any sharing economy, these are people who have capital, they invest the capital, they market, they gener generate a customer base and make money. That sounds like a traditional economy to me, which is, you know, fine. Uh, that's the American way. The, one of the things when you hear, hear about businesses say, well, you know, well, I'm dependent on this uh, trade, this short-term rental trade. I don't get a lot of the local customers in here. Maybe, but there has to be, someone has to speak to a level playing field. Um, if, you, you know, if you're a business owner, you should be sensitive to the fact that other business owners are now operating on a playing field that's not level, which would be the hotels, motels. The, um, the, uh, one of the other things is that um, if you own a business and you say, well, I need this trade to support myself, well, you know what? Suppose we started allowing your trade to operate in the residential zones in the same manner, without making the investment, without paying the taxes, and that, without living in the regulatory environment. That would be the un unlevel playing field that you would start experiencing that the motels and hotels do. So that's something that has to be weighed in. Also, we did talk about a registry. We talked about a rental permit. From the town's perspective, either it's a permitted or an appropriate use for a residential zone, or it's not. And creating that is really just legitimizing something that we already found to be inappropriate in the residential zone. So a, a, a lot of what we've talked about um, is <clears throat> the impact that uh, Airbnb and the rental units have on, uh, on businesses and on neighborhoods. I get the, you know, where your responsibility as government officials is in trying to control and maintain um, uh, safe living environments for neighborhoods. But to what degree do you wrestle with codifying for businesses? You know, a lot of what we're hearing from our hotels or, or real estate that they feel their business is being uh, adversely affected by Airbnb. To what degree, if any, should the municipalities be concerned about codifying laws that help businesses? Aiden? Well, um, I don't think it's our that we should be codifying laws that help businesses, but what we should be doing is help maintain the level playing field. And if you look at, and, and that's sort of tied into, steeped into our history and what has been traditional here, and renting homes is a tradition in this part of the world. The time frame traditionally that they've been rented, we spoke about earlier, mm -hmm. that after the crash of 2008, people's behavior changed, and we have to modify how we approach that and how we manage it. We can't turn the clock back. So it comes down to us deciding on what is a reasonable amount of time that we will allow somebody to rent their home 
where it still maintains the essential characters of being a, pr a primary residence or a residence as opposed to a commercial enterprise. And I'm sure if we went around the room, as we have done today, we, there's a multitude of opinions on that. Um, I believe that a two-week period uh, seems to me to strike that balance. And I think that allows the hotels and motels to pick. I have no idea how much of uh, traditional summer business would be two weeks or more in a local hotel or here. But I would, I would imagine that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that it may be shorter, shorter periods and whether the hotels and motels are happy with two weeks. So I see our, our, our role is to preserve the quality of neighborhoods, to preserve a level playing field for our local businesses who are here all year round and they're not just taking advantage of certain peaks in the high season. You know, so if they're here paying, paying taxes, employing local people all year round, they deserve to benefit from these special events, whether it be golf or, horse, or, or the horse classic or all these uh, other things that we shouldn't. Harbor Frost this weekend is a perfect example. I know the town's going to be absolutely rocking. So that's what I, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Michael, I think you had a question. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Daly, and I'm a real estate agent, uh, amongst other things, and so I, I live this issue a lot. Um, and as, as uh, you know, when you have a rental listing and the owner's calling you week in, week out, why haven't you rented my home? Why haven't you rented my home? Sometimes it's tempting to say, well, maybe you should try Airbnb um, uh, to help supplement it. I might rethink that uh, after this conversation. But I've, I've also used Airbnb. I've rented myself through Airbnb. I rented my own house through Airbnb several years ago. Mm -hmm. And after my $2,000 refrigerator got a dent in it, I decided I would never do that again. Um, I, think it's, I think the distinction that Aiden made uh, about owner being present and not being present is an important one and I think any of our, our legislation should take that into account because when you're not present then the community becomes the person who's managing your rental, right? And then lastly, I think you know it's a cottage industry to own investment homes out here. I would imagine that some of the people in the room here do own investment homes. And, but the more and more homes we take off the rental market, you know, remember a month ago we had a discussion here on affordable housing. And the more and more homes we take off the rental market uh, makes it that much more difficult for people who do live here and who do work here to find rentals. And, and it makes uh, living here less affordable for locals. Thanks, Michael. Can I go back? Uh, sure, absolutely. <laughs> Um, Michael, that is a bigger question, and maybe if the origin, I, I'm, as my scientific mind goes, I always go to what's the objective? If the objective is to augment income, then I know that both East Hampton and South Hampton have, over my 36 years in the business, twice hired outside consultants to address just that, affordable housing, and they all said you need to allow for mother-daughters, you need to allow for accessory structures, and yet neither town has done this. Neither one has allowed this. Maybe we can be proactive and take a look at a mother-daughter situation so that an older person can stay and a younger person can afford to live here. Uh, and maybe it just might dent the whole need for whether it's VRBO or Home Away or Airbnb, maybe that's a more civilized way to address it. Just a thought. Thank you, Judy. Gigi or Robert? Can I add to that on affordability? Because I've thought this question uh, quite a bit. And you know, I know some people, a single mom, two kids, who's using Airbnb to make it so she doesn't lose her house. So just to, so that, that doesn't, we don't lose an affordable unit by supplementing a little bit. So you know, maybe we need to think about that too. Maybe it, you know, it, we ought to look at a means test or something if somebody w would be allowed to you know, engage in the Airbnb shorter term rental. Wanted to add that East Hampton does have some initiatives for affordable apartments. They're they're fairly limited. I actually think the idea of mother daughter apartments on a more expanded basis might be a good idea. But you know the one thing that strikes me about Airbnb and the comments from the hotel owner is the tax issue, and I think that's a legitimate issue, not one that our town can cure, but maybe the state authorities can cure because. It looks like Airbnb could be an entity from which you could collect taxes. And one of the things that bothers me, um, and I, I have a son who's 29, and you know all the kids, I call them kids, 
in that age bracket are sort of trying to make their own careers. And what I notice about these disruptive uh, new businesses is that they tend to come in under all the regulatory, you know, radar that's out there. And they don't, prote you know, it's, it's like Uber doesn't protect their workers, they're not unionized, you know, you, they don't have health care. And it's, and I think that's a darker side of this unregulated economy. And I think that's one of the problems I have with Airbnb is that, yeah, it's disruptive kind of in a pleasant way in some ways because people can earn money. But to the extent, and I have some bias because I'm now an elected official, but to the extent they can come in and skirt our zoning laws and say, well, the character of your neighborhoods isn't so important to us because it's the character of the Airbnb community that's selling the product, that's not really acceptable. And I think we have a right to say no to that kind of market force and say we're not going to accept it and we're, we're going to do things to shape it differently. Yeah. almost gaming the system. Yep. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, you know, Airbnb isn't held to the same standards as hotels are, and this is what ho drives hotels crazy. They don't have to have handlebars next to the toilets. They don't have to have sprinklers in the rooms. They don't have to, you know, adhere to all these things that, that cost hotels a lot of money. So that whole notion of a lang level playing field is a big one. In terms of the labor issues, it's not, it doesn't pertain as much to Airbnb because the hosts are not their employees, you know, and if anything, the, th the two people, the two parties who do it really, really well under the Airbnb ecosystem are the travelers, because it's so much cheaper, um, and the hosts, because you get to keep, if you rent your place out for $100, you keep 97 of those dollars. If you're an Uber driver, you make pennies on what Uber makes. I mean, it's, it's much different. And they do that because they need the hosts. Without the host, there is no product. There's no inventory. But um, the tax issue is interesting. I mean, Airbnb does partner with cities to, to levy taxes. The, what the hotel industry says is, you know, Airbnb remit takes those taxes and remits them. So the, the, the towns are not seeing the data of who, how much it is and who's staying and everything like that. And, um, you know, so that's one issue. And Airbnb always says, we want to collect taxes. We want to pay taxes because that means they're being recognized. So they're in this fight with New York City. New York City does not, is not bending. And so they would love to pay taxes in New York City. But the moment New York City allows that, it's saying we're endorsing you. Uh, but the one thing about, of course, tax behavior, if you want to encourage behavior, you, know, you can use tax policy to encourage or discourage behavior. So, you know, in New York City, the city is considering adding a $12 congestion pricing fee onto Uber and Lyft or ride sharing. Uh, that has crowded the cities. I'm probably guilty of it. I take a car sometimes with just me. Uh, I don't own a car, so I feel like I'm doing better that way. But you know, that is going to have a tremendous impact on people's behavior. And so maybe there's a way to creatively use tax policy to encourage the kind of behavior you want and discourage the kind of behavior you don't. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, uh, touch on the base of taxes because we're talking about taxes like we're talking about sales tax and hotel multi tax, but we're not talking about property taxes. You know, when these are being used as a commercial property and they're paying residential underlying fee residential taxes, it's a substantial difference. Um, that's one of the things that I think we need to focus more on. And, you know, I was an assessor for 15 years, and I just, I can be on a bash because none of you vote in Southall. Um, <laughs> now, let me just tell, and what people say, well, we're going to pay more in property taxes. One lady stood up and said, I bought a house that was one of the worst in my community. I spent $150,000 renovating it just to list it on Airbnb. Now, I had been an assessor for 15 years. My first thought was, I wonder if she got a building permit. <laughs> she didn't. Uh, but, you know, that's one of the things that we need to get back to. It's a substantial difference between commercial properties and residential properties, and we cannot tax them as commercial properties unless it's a verified change of zone. So, so could you um, uh, assess a, a property based on the increased value of it as a, as a, as a rental operation? Well, how are you going to determine the increased value? Uh, you know, it has to go back to use, but if you're not getting the documentation of the, of the income or the vacancy collection losses, you can't do that. Plus, in New York State, it's very difficult to assess commercial taxes to a property that's zoned residentially. Uh, it's they're CO to single-family dwellings in most instances. So to bring them into onto the commercial side of the tax rolls is very difficult. Thanks, uh, Robert. Uh, <coughs> Bob Plum from Sag Harbor. Just to address the hotel issue a little bit, people have tried to address it. It seems to most people inherently unfair just on the face of it. But Ian Schrager, for instance, his new line of hotels. It doesn't have a front desk. He has like five or six of these now. 
you book them the same way they do Airbnb. There's no front desk and the, it, their rooms, and then there are about three or four common spaces or bars in the hotels. Oh yeah, so so you get a <coughs> you, you stay in a hotel in a city, but there are common uh, areas. It just seems like the uh, they need an Airbnb for hotels. That it would, I mean, they were set up for one night um, stays. So why not just use the Airbnb method and just book them that way? I, I don't understand. I think what I'm saying is the te air, air, the hotel technology needs to follow what the market wants, as we said. Um, I live next door to an Airbnb that is pretty much that's all this house is used for. I don't know if the code enforcement is here, but uh, <laughs> but I know what it's like to live next door, and I think several things matter. One is, is it just a couple for the weekend, or is it you know a couple, five teenagers, all their friends, blah blah blah. So I, I guess I have two questions. One is, um, and I'm sorry I don't know this. The issue of the homeowner being present seems really important to me, and I don't know what East Hampton and South Hampton do. Are you allowed a shorter stay if the homeowner is present? Um, and the other is enforcement, because I know that Sag Harbor has a lot of trouble with enforcement. It's good to have the rule, but if you can't enforce it. So how hard is enforcement? Um, is it just dependent on a neighbor complaining? Can you go through the Airbnb site and then just come down on people, or how does that work? at the microphone. For a South Old Draw legislation, a barcode has what's called uh, presumptive guilt. If you're s by simply appearing on Airbnb or one of those sites, we can issue a violation. And that's how we get the compliance. Um, the issue, look, understand something. Yes, compliance is a problem, but unless you have a code, there's nothing to enforce. You need the code first. The code enforcement should come second. And we did beef up code enforcement with new code enforcement officers, et cetera, for this and for other reasons. Yes, we can. Now, you have to remember that because the code says up to 5000 or up to 10000 ultimately it's up to a judge to assign that fee. But again, we violated 43 of what we estimate right now, about 80 left operating. We got compliance right away. In three instances, we did have to go to court and file a restraining order because we couldn't get compliance. And we've been legally challenged on the law. Uh, we won the first round in Article 78. The gentleman that's pursuing it just filed in federal court. So we will be facing that, but the courts generally are very deferential to the zoning authorities of the towns. But does it fine to bring in pay for those lawsuits? Like if, this, if, if your town paying more to enforce, it actually, you see what I'm saying? Like no, it's, look, it's, it's part of the legal equation. And you know what? The enforcement of any section of code is the cost of doing business. When you, when you refer to the owner being present, um, you know, typically in Airbnb, even though it's called B&B, they're not bed and breakfast. Um, some of the towns actually have bed and breakfast provisions. And if you file and you get a license to be a bed and breakfast, you can rent by the night. You're basically a hotel operation, but with only one or two rooms, and yet the owner must be there. The typical B&B or Airbnb or HomeAway or VRBO rental the homeowner is not there. So when you say present, do we mean, like I mentioned, present within the community, like be able to respond, to be able to get there quickly if there's a complaint, to be available and accessible versus actually living in that house. And, you know, if, if you have two apartments there, you, you know, you're basically a two-family home. You're probably not going to comply with the law unless you're some pre-existing. And, you know, we've talked about accessory apartments, but only for the purposes of affordability not for vacation rentals. Uh, Jeff? Uh, and in East Hampton, we do have a provision um, that allows you to rent rooms in your home while you're living in your home, subject to the regulations on length of stay. So there is a niche to do that. that th that's about? You know what? I, I believe it's the same, but I, I, haven't looked at the <laughs> I haven't looked at the code recently. But I know I don't know what the time frame on it, but there's a specific percentage of the house that you can rent. Our statute actually refers to bedrooms. It says two bedrooms in East Hampton. Airbnb's business is two thirds uh, renting the whole home, and actually one third, which I was I th I thought that's a lot, where the owner is present at the time of the rental. And I've done both out here um, and in other places. Uh, Thanks. Uh, Nat, you had a question. 
couple comments on the subject of taxes and so on. So we want to have a level playing field, no doubt. And I think Airbnb does have a situation that you can pay the tax when you, when you rent on Airbnb. But we also acknowledge that this is sort of like under the radar kind of activity. So the folks that are in Airbnb, there's a percentage of them that are happy to be under the radar. And under the radar is a cash deal. We all know what a cash deal means, right? Right. So when, you know, when we're at our front desk and we're, it's a Thursday and the phone's ringing at our hotel or on Friday, and we're having a conversation with a potential customer and we're telling what our room rates are, what our policies are, and so on, and they're literally telling us on the end of the phone that they just were on an Airbnb and they saw where we are, they saw where houses are. We're on the front line. We're hearing this directly from the people that are calling our hotel, what they're seeing, what their price point. They're telling us the numbers. They have no idea what these houses look like, what the situation is, and so on. So, of course, when we give them a rate, we're telling them also with their sales tax, and there's also the motel occupancy tax, which is another 3%. So we have, you know, altogether we have almost like 12, 13% of tax we've got to pay, plus the property tax that we're assessed for, plus we have all the other re regulations we have with regard to sprinkler inspections, the Department of Health comes to our hotel and inspects our pools, inspects our rooms, we're completely exterminating our property on a regular, we have all these expenses, it's not the same playing field at all. So there's a disparity in that in that concept. And so it was interesting you made the comment about uh, is the village interested in codifying laws that are the benefit of business? Well, when the motel tax was increased for, from one and a half to three percent, that didn't help our business because people who are thinking of coming out here now suddenly have to pay more taxes. No one called and I didn't thank anybody for that. That wasn't helpful. <laughs> so in general, I don't find government goes out of the way to, to help businesses, I think government goes out of the way to help the community and the residents. And that's really the conversation we're having here. And at the end of the day, if taxes are being collected, they benefit the community. Because if the village doesn't get the taxes, where is the village going to have the money to pay for things that it needs? Affordable housing, better roads, and, and situation like that. So when you take away the tax structure, then as a taxpayer you end up having to pay more taxes because that's the only result, is the village has to increase the taxes because it's losing tax revenue from businesses like us that aren't paying that tax. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. I saw a question down this way. I wanted, I wanted to talk to the gentleman that owns the Sag Harbor Hotel. You said that the U.S. Open hasn't benefited you. In um, town of Southampton, uh, most of the houses around Southampton in the village are all rented already for the U.S. Open. This has been since, like, October. I mean, we, we, there's, like, a list of homeowners that are on a waiting list now for houses. You have to get on a waiting list, you know, if you want your house to rent for those um, week or two weeks of U.S. Open, and every homeowner that we have in our office is telling us they want to rent for that time period. And you could call up also the, um, the, the U.S. Association, Golf Association, Southampton, and you could get on their list. Like, this has been going on for a long time now. You know, this is not just recently, but it may be that because you're in Sag Harbor that people don't want to go that far. You know, they want to be closer to where the U.S. Open is going to be. And um, I have another question for everyone in this room. When you go away on vacation, do you go for a week or two weeks with your family? Like, how many people could take off for two weeks straight at a time? One week. One week. I mean, two weeks is costly for a lot of families, you know, if you're going to go on various ca vacations throughout the year. We, we have to be open to the one-week rentals. Otherwise, we'll, we're losing the business to Airbnb, HomeAway, all these other websites, because guess what? They're here to stay, whether you like them or not. They're not going away. So why should we lose economy money to those people when we could be making it? All the brokerage firms out here, we could be making it. The homeowners, you know, you're hurting us. You're really hurting us by not allowing one-week rentals. And as for the shops, in all, I, I shop in all the stores, and who could possibly afford $300 for a blouse? <laughs> You know, it's like, it's the landlords that are like renting to these shops, $400 for a t-shirt. It's like crazy. You know, why, why are they pop-ups and they go away? No one could afford that. The locals cannot, I live here full time. Uh, you know, everyone that comes out on the weekends that has the money to shop in those stores, you know what? They don't even want to because they know it's like a ripoff. We need to get like, 
more reasonable stores out here if they want to stay open. You know, Can I, I want to comment on the issue of the real estate um, agents because I get that real estate is one of the biggest industries we have. And a lot of people locally make their living renting and selling homes. And that, you know, according to Airbnb, I have 800 houses using Airbnb in the town of Southampton for short-term rentals, which means that it's kind of already happening and you guys don't get any commission from it because you guys are playing by the rules. You're playing by the rules and that's not an opportunity. On the other hand, you know, I, like I'm in the hotel industry. I've mentioned that before. I own a hotel in Montauk and I have long been troubled by competition from Airbnb as well. It's not a level playing field. I collect those 12% taxes. I get my pool inspected. We have transient rental permits. It's really tough, and then you have this competition. So I personally feel never should a house be rented less than a week, and never should there be any kind of daily maid service or any of the kinds of things that a hotel provides. And I don't think even if somebody's gonna rent for one week, it can be done 52 times a year. There's a magic number there, maybe 10 times a year or something like that. So we've gotta figure out what frequency, and so we can drive some of the business back to the hotels which are supposed to be transient rentals. So, you know, I, I think there's, I, uh, Airbnb should be, if it's gonna be used, it, you guys should be able to take advantage of it and be able to supplement your incomes and not only allow those homeowners to take advantage of it. That doesn't seem fair either. So, hey, Jay, so we have, uh, we're taking one more question, Charlie, uh, I think, and then we're gonna have to wrap this up. Yeah. My name's Charlie McCarran. I've been a landlord in Sag Harbor for over 40 years. And I also was a painting contractor. And I go by the old thing when the guy who was making buggy wits had a factory and then cars came along, he was out of business. Well, everybody has to adjust when things change. I actually had to give up being a painting contractor because of the competition. There was just too much competition, plus I had real estate and other things I was doing. But I, the guy with the motel, that's competition. That's what, it, you know, Uber is competition. Everybody has to adjust to the competition. Don't be whining that they're taking business away. Everybody has competition. Just look at the plates here and everything else. It's made, made in, probably made in China. Everybody has to adjust. And, and if somebody can get an AB, Airbnb, AB, whatever it is, uh, <laughs> Air, <laughs> Airbnb, and then get spent $100 a night instead of staying in a hotel in Sag Harbor, and I heard that in Barron's last month, last year, they were charging $1,500 one night. Why wouldn't somebody take Airbnb in Sag Harbor for $100 a night? And the other thing is, we've had bed and breakfasts in America for 100 years or more. I don't know what the difference is Air, Airbnb is. What's the big complaint about it? We've had it forever. So everybody has to adjust. And I just hate the whining People say, oh, they're hurting my business. Well, do something about it. Lower on your prices, or I don't know what. But uh, anyway, I, hit, I don't like the whining. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to uh, uh, wrap that up now. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's getting late. Uh, I do want to mention, of course, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, Lee uh, will be uh, having a book signing across the street. Uh, what day? Today, right now. Today? Oh, this afternoon. Great. Right after here. Okay. Everybody. And tomorrow's Harbor Frost. So uh, we've covered a lot of ground, and certainly we want to keep this conversation going. Um, please, if uh, you want to comment on what you heard today, uh, co uh, write letters to the editor, uh, letters at sagharborexpress.com, or contact Catherine Manu at the office, 631-725-1700. Uh, this, uh, this forum sold out in two weeks. If you want to participate in the next forum, which will be on March uh, 23rd, and will address parking in Sag Harbor, I suggest you reserve early. You may see Ellen D. O'Garty at the door. Our thanks to our sponsors and to LTV, and thank you all for coming.